remember what we're doing. If you haven't been here on a Wednesday night, this is week three or part three of our series called How to Read the Bible. This is not a new believers series. Though if you are a new believer, if you're watching online, you're a new believer, fantastic. What a great way to start off in your faith. But if you've been a Christian for 30 years, um, I'm hoping, uh, for those of you that have been here for the last couple weeks, has this been helpful so far? Yes, good, because it's, I think it's just any chance we get to realign ourselves to the Word of God and to just a, a, a fresh intake of how to read the Bible. It's a really important thing to, to learn how. And of course, we could say, well, you just have to read it and God will speak it to you. But we talked about this last week. God chose to intervene into human language, into human history, into the world we live in. He gave us his word. If I just disregard that and be like, well, if God wants to say something to me, he'll just say it. Then I'm disregarding everything that God's already done by giving me his word. And so it's like God saying, here's my word. You know, read this. Everything that pertains to life and godliness, the Bible tells us. And then we say, well, if God wants to speak to me, he'll just say something. It's totally disrespecting and disregarding what he's already said to us. So um, that's what we looked at. We looked at the idea of context last week. And I want to, um, week three, and if you're a note taker, I'll, I'll, I'll give this to you. This is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about inspiration and authority. We're going to talk about inspiration and authority. And if you are a, if you have questions that you want to ask, remember, you can do so right on the app. If you just go to the app, there's a, the top line says, ask a question. If you're watching at home or you're here, you can just go to the app, click on the ask a question, and you'll enter the room, Calvary San Diego, Calvary SD, and then you can send in your question. Um, I want to talk about inspiration and uh, why. Okay, why are we going to talk about inspiration? Inspiration has to do with, and maybe let's throw up that definition, Danny, of inspiration. Here's what inspiration means. When we say inspiration, we're talking about this. It's that God, the Holy Spirit, worked in a unique supernatural way so that the written words of the scripture writers were also the words of God. Now, if that's really a lot, don't worry. We're going to break that down. There won't be a, a test on this um, later anyway, so don't worry about that. But that is a proper definition of what inspiration means. Inspiration means this. I want you to think of inspiration. And the reason we're talking about it is because it affects every time you read the Bible. It's incredibly important. Inspiration means this. We believe that God spoke his words through human beings. Those two things, that God, God spoke his words to human beings. And it's critical that we understand that. Um, the Bible itself claims to be inspired by God. So the Bible makes the claim. It's not just that we think that. The Bible actually claims to be inspired by God. Let me give that to you, and I'll put these up on the screen. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, the scriptures say this, All scripture is inspired by God. And that includes both Old and New Testaments. Every book, every word, every sentence that you read in the Bible that is the Bible, and not the notes in there, but the actual Bible, is inspired, the Bible says, by God. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 1, 20, and 21, no prophecy of Scripture ever comes about by the prophet's own imagination. For no prophecy was ever born of human impulse. Rather, men carried along by the Holy Spirit were moved by God. So there it is, inspiration. God spoke through human beings who wrote things down from their understanding, from their context, in their language. And so the Bible is, a, is an inspired book spoken into the culture of the world at that time. And that's incredibly important. It's incredibly important because, and I'm just going to, this is a side note, we're not going to deal with it tonight, but I want to mention it because I want your head to be able to think down this road. Because I hear a lot today about how we... You know, um, we're become, you know, cultural relevance as a negative thought for Christianity. That's a big thing. I hear it a lot. Oh, you, you know, we don't, have to, we don't need to be culturally relevant. We need to stand against the culture. And all these sentences are well-intentioned, but they don't, it's, it's, 
It's an inaccurate statement because it's, being, it's coming from a place of fear and not understanding. God intervened into culture. God spoke into culture, not out of culture, but into our culture. And not just, not just the New Testament, but also in the Old Testament. God spoke to people in the way they would understand in their language, in their understandings, in their cultures, and at their time. And we talked about last week how that, you know, what, uh, co- without context, it's hard. I've, t- I've gotten a chance to talk to a few of you before, and you've told me, and I'm curious if this is kind of, if there's any consensus on this. Some of you told me before that the Bible, it's, when you start to read with context, it really changes the way you read the Bible. Has that been true for some of you? Good. You want to read it, and then we want to get the context of what's happening so that it makes it just that much more and more rich. So, The Bible tells us that it is God-breathed. That's what it means to be inspired. God-breathed. Okay? Two things. Number one, the Bible is a human book. The Bible is a human book. We have it. We have it in as many languages as we can. We're still translating it into languages. And then when we translate it into a language, we start over again and we make it better so that because the language changed by the time we finish it. And then we do it again and we do it again and we do it again. Why? Because within the culture of any language, the language changes because of the culture. That, that's, there's nothing wrong. God didn't speak Old King James when we got the Bible. So we're not worried about that. We're going to continue to like re, you know, look at it and go, okay, what's the best way that I can say this to make sure you get the idea? And again, as I said, when we talk about culture in the Bible, we'll talk more about that. But there's things that we hold so dearly to us, you know, you know, oh, you know, uh, J- Jesus is the good shepherd. You know, we love that. Oh, we love that he's the good shepherd. But in some cultures, it doesn't work. They had to translate it a different way because to say he's the good shepherd, what people were like, well, that's a terrible thing. How could you talk about God that way? It was an insult to, t- to call him a shepherd. They had to find an analogy that would work with the context of what it means. So we'll talk about that. The Bible was written in the language that the writers understood. In other words, when God breathed upon these men, and it was men who wrote the scriptures, when God breathed upon them, they did not start writing in some other like heavenly language. They didn't, there wasn't some other heavenly language that they wrote it into. They wrote it in the language that they understood. The Bible is written in three languages. There are three languages connected to the original text of the Bible. And let's just quickly go through what they are. What's the first one that you can think of? Okay, I heard Hebrew really loud. Okay, what's the other one? Okay, I heard Greek. And then give me the third one. Aramaic. Very good. Yeah, the common language. What was spoken of that that preceded the the birth of Jesus and then it continued a bit afterwards. So we have these three languages that that the Bible was written into. But remember, the Bible was also written over a 1,500-year period. Think about trying to to create unity among a book that was started 1,500 years ago and you're going to try to finish it today. How bizarre would that be? Themes and concepts and topics and ideas and yet... When you and I read it today, the Bible's a completely cohesive, one theme, one concept, equally, equally paced out. It's unbelievable. How is that possible? That's what we mean by it's God-breathed. We'll talk more about that part, but I want to stay focused on the idea that it was written by human beings. It's a human book. It was written in the context that people understood. It was not, listen, Just because we don't understand their context doesn't mean that when it was written, they didn't understand it. They did understand that context. Now, it's been a couple thousand years. We have to keep on learning. What did it mean to them then? That's why we focus on context. The Bible influenced culture. And culture influenced the way that the Bible was written. God wanted to make sure that the people who would read it would be able to understand it. And so the Bible was written in, 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 I don't want to say simple, but in common language in ways that was completely understood by its reader. The second thing that I want to say is this. The Bible is a divine book. Okay, the Bible is a divine book. 
And what that means is that even though a human being wrote these words down, these words that are in the Bible that we have in front of us, these words are breathed by God and thus they carry the weight of who God is into all of our lives. It's as if God himself is wanting to speak to you, but he did it through that person's pen at that time for all of eternity. Powerful. Now the thing about, the, the, when, once we, you and I accept that the Bible is inspired, and by the way, and this is not, we're not doing this on our Wednesday nights, it's a great thing to learn, is how do we believe, why do we believe that the Bible is the Bible? It's a great thing, maybe sometime we'll get to do that. That's not what we're doing here, but let me just say this. The answer to that question is not simply, well, because it's God's word. That's circular thinking right there, right? It doesn't work. And just because the Bible says it's the Bible doesn't make it the Bible. Right? I mean, we, you, anybody could claim that. There's a lot more criteria that goes into the Bible actually being the Bible. It's not as mystical and as religious as we might all think. It's a lot more concise, clear, scientific even. It is very structured in why the Bible is the Bible that we believe it to be. So I'm asking you to accept that tonight, but it's, a, it's not a difficult thing for us to, to take, to, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a bigger subject, but to examine that the Bible is the word of God is an important thing. And we don't discredit anybody. I've had tons of people in witnessing to them, they say, well, I don't believe the Bible and I don't make it my goal to like, now I have to prove this to you. But no, okay, I get that. I mean, I don't believe that the Quran is from God, but there's a billion Muslims that would disagree with me. So it comes down to a clear, kind of a, 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 a clear logical approach to it. Can you prove that this book is from God? And we believe that we definitely can uh, as it relates to the Bible. But there's an issue that I want to raise about inspiration that's really important. And it's a word that you'll hear, maybe, maybe we don't talk about it much in church, and, but it's, it's kind of an important word for when we talk about the Bible. It's the word inerrant. And again, there's not going to be a test, so you don't need to remember this. Or it's not, but the word inerrant means this. It means to be free from error. So what that means is this. We believe that the Bible not only is breathed by God, but that it is free from all errors. Now, this is a tough thing to, to deal with because the Bible that you're holding in front of you, whether it be English or Spanish or honestly just about any language, has some errors. I know it's terrible to say that, right? We can't say that at church the Bible has errors. It does. There's some things that the way that the translators translated words that are, are different than the way they were in the Old Testament. We'll talk about that. Don't lose your faith right now. That's not the point here. The point is this. We believe that because, listen, because God is free from any error, he's perfect, everything he says must also be perfect. God can't say something that is wrong because he is right. And why does any of this matter? And it's going to be the main, it's going to be the thing I want to get to in just a minute, but I'll say it now. It's this. It is why with 100% certainty, you and I can sit down in the morning with your cup of coffee. Anybody cup of coffee Bible readers? Who are you? Who's the real Christians? Okay, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding about that. It's, it's okay. Who does tea? Anybody do tea in their Bibles? Okay, that's all right. Okay, all right, all right. God loves you. Some of you just sit there and don't drink anything at all. How do you, pagans, how do you do this? No. So what I want you to do is that the, tomorrow when you sit down to read the Bible, I want you to read with the expectancy that we spoke about. We pray and we ask God to open our eyes and our ears and our hearts, but also know this, just know this. Have this total confidence that because every single word that was spoken by God to those people that wrote it down, that you now have in your hand, that you're holding, phone, tablet, none of it matters. Whatever it is that you've got the word of God in, it is free from error, which means it should have full authority in your life. That's critical. That's critical. I'm a, I'm a, who, who are my book readers? You like to read books. Who are my nerds? I'm a nerd. I'm out there. We're not nerds. I'm just kidding. But book readers, right? But you know what I say about most books? You got to eat the meat and spit out the bones, right? You read a book and you're like, oh, that was really good. That part, and eh, you know, whatever. The Bible is the only book that you're going to read where there is only it's all pure and it's perfect. 
Every single bit of it. So when you read it and you don't agree with it, you can know you're the one that's wrong. It's, it's the only book that you can have that certainty. When you don't like what God's saying, you know that he's right. You can still not like it, but he's right. It's okay to disagree with God. I'm telling you, I've read something, I read some things at times, and I'm like, man, I hate that. It's true, but that's why I hate it. Because it's true, and I'm, you know, let God be true and every man a liar, the Bible says. And that's what the Bible does over and over. It just shows me that I have to submit myself under God's authority. Okay, so back to inerrancy or back to the idea of inspiration. The idea, um, the idea means that, and, and I, I'm going to talk about it a little bit more in just a second, but the idea means that the Bible is without error. So if we see things that seem to be contradictory, it, it means that there must be a logical or clear answer to that. Otherwise, God would be wrong and God could never be wrong. Now, I want to read to you from Matthew chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. And I want you to see the dual elements of inspiration, written by men, inspired by God. It's written by a person, but it's inspired by God. Here it is. This all happened that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Did you see it? Do you see it there? And then it goes on, look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, they will call him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. But go back to verse 22 for me, and look at this. So it was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord. That's that it's a divine book. It's a divine word. Through the prophet, God spoke through people his word. And that's why when you read the Bible, you will get different like you read the books of First and Second Peter and there's a different tone and a different attitude and a different mindset. And then you read the letters of Paul and you're like, wow, this guy seems like he was pretty smart. Then you read John and you're like, it's so sweet and it brings out so many sweet emotions. And, and you just have, di you have different personalities because God spoke by the Lord through the prophets. By the Lord and through the prophets. Okay, so as I said before, and I'm going to throw up a definition of inerrancy here. Go ahead, Danny, and put up that definition of inerrancy. And you can read it while I'm talking. Again, it's a long definition. There will not be a test. But I just want you to, for those of you that like that, you can at least see what that is, okay? It means that there is not one part of the written word of God that has any errors. Because if the Bible has errors, if the words of God have errors, then that means God is has errors, and God cannot because that's not who he is. And so I want to mention just a couple of areas because what happens is, is this is where most people who want to attack Christianity in the Bible, they come after this idea of inerrancy. And the way they do it is this. How can you believe a book that is filled with contradictions? And of course, if we're just going to be defensive, we're going to say, no, it's not. Shut up. What do you know? You know? But that doesn't help anybody, does it? So then we have to take a critical, and by critical, I don't mean a criticizing. Critical means a thoughtful, logical, just we're, we're putting our head into it. We take a critical approach to the Bible. Are there contradictions? And if there are, why are they there? And I'm so thankful, guys. There has been hundreds and hundreds of beautiful minds who have already done all that work for us. And if you are what I call myself, and I'll call you this too, if you're like the Bible nerd that is really interested in all that kind of stuff, there's a ton of books on that. You can jump into them and you'll just eat it up and you'll love it. If, you just, if you're like, ah, eh, that's not really my thing. It doesn't change your Christianity in the slightest. What we need to all agree upon is this. If the Bible not only claims to be the inerrant word of God, it means it must be because God cannot make a mistake. But there are contradictions that people will say. And there's three areas, and I'm just going to mention them. There's three main areas where people claim that the Bible has contradictions. Again, I'm just saying this to give you and me just a little bit more confidence in the Bible. The three areas are this. It's the contradictions in, with science, contradictions with history, and then contradictions with itself. And by the way, all three of these are true. At face value, there are what appears to be contradictions based on the way that we just at a surface would read that. It's science, history, and then with itself. Um, I'll mention a few 
let's see here. I'll mention, like, for instance, where, where uh, the, the biggest one, and again, we don't believe this, but the biggest area where people say science and the Bible don't match is, of course, what area do you think it is where they say that science and the Bible don't match up? Yeah, creation, evolution, exactly. And here's the thing about trying to prove something that none of us were there to see. It's, it's unscientific. If you cannot prove it in a laboratory or by a test or by a visual, it cannot be a, it is not scientifically able to be proven. So friends, when somebody says to you, you cannot scientifically prove to me that there was, that God created the world, the answer to that is, you are correct. Don't get mad at them like, no, uh you're wrong, pagan, you know, that's not true. They're correct. You cannot prove through science that God created the world. You can't. But friends, you cannot prove evolution as scientific because that has also not been able, nobody's seen that happen. Nobody, it's just, it's just, it, it invalidates both arguments. So we don't need to argue like we don't, I, my gospel witness is not that I prove to somebody that creation is true. I know a lot of people who believe that creation is true. The devil believes creation is true. He's not going to heaven. Creationism didn't save anybody. The Bible, James says that even the, even the demons believe. And so, again, if I'm tearing down something you love so much, I believe in the creation of the world through God. Don't, don't freak out. But I'm not going to lose sleep over arguing with somebody over this point. No, because neither of us can prove that. So that's one area where they say, hey, how can you believe the Bible? Because the Bible doesn't say, the Bible says that God created the world when we all know it's evolution. But again, we just disagree on that. We disagree on that. Neither of us saw God create the world or evolution. We've, we've seen neither. So it's invalidated. What about history? Does the Bible contradict history? There are many who would say, and they've said this for years and years and centuries even, that the Bible is historically inaccurate. The beautiful thing about living in 2021 is this. That argument is no longer included in any scholarly work today. The Bible has been proven to be more accurate than anybody ever imagined in the past. In fact, let me tell you one that I think is so exciting because it was in our lifetimes or most of our lifetimes. We, who, who's the greatest king of Israel? David. Man, if you were on Jeopardy, you would have won. That would have been, what is David? Who is David? I mean, not what, yeah, who is David? So, so David, right? Did you know that it was, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to do this without giving away the, the point here. There are no historical records of a king named David in the world. That's a problem, isn't it? This guy that the Bible talks about extensively, who arguably was the greatest king in all of Israel, you'd think that somebody would have written his name down. Nothing. Did you guys know that the first time we found anything with the name King David on it was in 1993? 1993. And so before that, guess what everybody was saying? How can you believe the Bible about this ridiculous guy named King David when there's no proof of him at all? And what did we have to say back then? Oh, yeah, well, you're dumb. You know, I mean, we had no arguments. We had nothing to say. But guess what? You know what the best friend to the Bible has been in the world today? Archaeology. Indiana Jones, go all day. I love it. They keep on. And so again, where there's apparent contradictions, it's been proven to be that the Bible was accurate and true. And the last one I want to mention is this, is the idea that the Bible contradicts itself. And to that point, I want to say this. Are you ready? It does sometimes, at least in our translations, which is why when we talk about the Bible being inerrant, we do not believe that the English Bible or the Spanish Bible or the Tagalog Bible or the Hungarian Bible or the Amharic Bible or the Arabic Bible is inspired. We do not believe that those words are inerrant. We believe that what God gave originally was without error. But I'll give you a couple examples of like things that are apparent contradictions that people will use. on you. Hey, how can you believe the Bible? Look at it, it says this, and then it says this. I'll give you a great example. In Mark chapter 9, we read about Jesus entering into the city of Jericho. And uh, it says that there were, I believe it's in, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 9. Uh, let's see here. In, in uh, 
In Matthew, it says that as they were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed them, and two blind men were sitting by the road, and they cried out, have mercy on us. And then in Mark chapter 10, it says that there was one blind man on the road who was crying out, saying, Lord, have mercy on us. Well, that's a contradiction, and it must invalidate the whole Bible, right? Right? And the answer is no, it doesn't quite do that, but it is a problem. It is a dilemma that at least we should be willing to consider. Well, it's not a very difficult thing. Remember what I said. The the inspiration of the word of God is two things. What are they? What was the first one? The Bible is a human book. And then the second one was the Bible is a divine book, right? Okay. When you let human beings write something from their perspective, you're going to get different views, aren't you? If I were to ask you to right now look at the stage and write the one thing that you notice the most, and so I'm going to have you do that. You're not going to break up. I've got, I've got a group assignment for you in just a minute. Don't worry. If you're new, we do group assignments here, okay? Uh, but I want you to do this right now. I want you to think of the, the most obvious thing on the stage to you or the thing that you see first. How's that? We'll go with that. The first thing that you see, and, and, and don't shout it out yet. I'm going to give you five more seconds. Four, three, two, one. Okay, I want, don't shout it out, but somebody over here tell me what it is, what you th- see. The, okay, the back thing here, okay? Does anybody see something else that was your first thing that you noticed? Yeah. You saw me. Yeah, hey, yes. Woo, word. Anything else? Drums. Anything else? Yeah. Guitar. Do you see the point that I'm trying to make? I asked one question, and now which one, of, which one of those answers was wrong? And let me ask you this. Which one of those answers contradicts the other answer? None of them. No, friends. So you can have there be two blind men, but Mark highlights one blind man. He's not making a statement that says there was only one blind man. He only highlights one blind man's conversation. Do you see what I'm doing there? These are the kinds of contradictions that are all over the Bible that really are no contradictions at all. But they do require a little bit of thought, a little bit of patience. And and once you do that, you discover that the Bible is a beautiful, clear book that is not only free from error, but finally, it, this, it has authority in my life. It must have authority. If I truly believe, and this is the one that should shake all of us, and I really want this to, if you believe that the Bible is not only accurate, correct, but also completely without error and inspired divinely by God, it must be surrendered to at all costs. I must surrender my life to the words of God if it is truly the words of God. There's no in-between. And this is where we see so much disparity between what is called Christian and what is Christian. We are not Christian because we come from a cultural identity or we were born into that, or, oh, more Americans are Christian than not. It's not true. You can't, there is no, there is no culturally identified Christianity where you are that because you were just born into that, or because you agree with certain things. It doesn't work like that. What is it that makes me and what makes you a Christian is this. I have surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. And that is an ongoing part of my life. I am both eternally saved, but the Bible also says that I'm also being saved. I'm being saved. You know who I'm being saved from the most? Me. I'm being saved from me. But I'm also being saved from hell and from death and from the devil. I am saved. You know what? The Bible says that, that he, who, um, he who justifies me also sees me glorified. God sees me right now with him in the heavens for eternity, but he also sees me right here, right now. It's creepy and weird. It doesn't make any sense. Truly, it doesn't make any sense. Don't, it's, you'll, you're, you're, our heads will blow up. We can't understand it. 
but it's true. And so if I really believe that the word of God is inspired by God, then what he says are my marching orders. What he says, what his heart is, must become my heart's. And we mix metaphors all day long because of, a, of, a, of cultural ideas rather than biblical ideas. We mix metaphors of, oh, the Christian is this and it's this and it's this. But no, what is it? A Christian is a follower of Jesus. We are following Jesus. We're reading his word and we're letting what he says move the direction of my life. And how do I do that? I invite his Holy Spirit to guide me, to lead me, to empower me, to break me down where I am wrong, to show me where I need Christ in my life more, to show me where I need to repent. I'm believing that the words of God are life. So the point that I'm making is this. The Bible must have all authority. If it is truly the word of God, it must have full authority in my life. Now, I want to ask a question. How did Jesus view the Bible? This is not your homework. We're almost there. How did Jesus view the Bible? And now, by the way, when I say the Bible and Jesus, remember, they only had the Old Testament at the time. So how did Jesus see the Bible? Jesus, over and over in the New Testament, he tells us exactly how, you know, he quotes from almost every Old Testament book. He loved Genesis. He loved Exodus. The craziest stories in the Bible, the most wildly ridiculous stories in the Bible, Jesus quoted them. As Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights, Jesus said. I mean, it's a story that everybody's like, oh, is that really real? It's a little bit hard to believe. Jesus quoted it. Jesus believed in the Bible. (laughs) He, he, he lived, but in fact, guess what the Bible says? It says that, it says that, um, that not one word will, will pass, or that he, had, he so excuse me, he's come to fulfill every jot and tittle of the word of God. You know what that means? We say comma and period. Every comma, every period, Jesus said, I've come to fulfill. He believes in the Bible. He believes in the Bible. We should believe in the Bible. Because God's word is inspired, it has authority in my life. If God's word was not free from error, if God's word was not divine, if it was just the words of people, I can tell you already, it would have been proven wrong hundreds of years ago. Trust me, the Bible has not held up because people haven't tried. You just have to know that. It's not like all the smart people are like, oh, I don't, the Bible's dumb and I don't believe it, but I'm not going to take the time to disprove it. Friends, people have been spending centuries trying to disprove the Bible. They just haven't been able to. In fact, Jesus himself told us that the reason that people will not come to Christ is not because of an intellectual ability to to, to not understand. They have the ability to understand. Jesus said this, men love darkness rather than light. It's not an intellectual reason. Friends, I read the Bible and I believe it is the word of God and yet I'm still doing things I shouldn't do at times. Amen to your life, not mine. Don't amen me. Do you know what I'm talking about? Why? Because there's parts of our hearts that still love darkness rather than light. That's a hard thing to admit. It's a difficult thing to understand. And this, when you and I invest our lives, the place that you're at, the season that you're in, the people that are around your life at this time, when you invest your heart, your mind, your passion, your energies into the word of God, do you know how much better church is when we all do that? We come together not to be fed for the first time, but to be energized together by the word of God and the common grace of God over all of our lives. This is where we ought to be getting one, our news, our science, our history, our philosophy, and our religion. It all comes from the word of God. And so I want to do a couple, I want to do a couple assignments. Now, if this is your first time here, this is what's going to happen. You're going to gravitate, distance socially, however you can do that. You know, just get as close to people as you're comfortable to do. And we're going to, I'm going to give you a couple assignments. It's not going to take very long. This was a more talk at week, and I apologize for that. But we can do questions. If you have questions or 
it can be on this or any of the subjects or anything else. Send in your questions now so that I can start getting prepped. There you go. That's how to do it. And by the way, I'm not going to be doing assignments. Listen, this is like progressive assignments, okay? What that means is I'm going to include everything we've been learning. I'm not going to just do one week and one week. and one. We're just going to keep putting it all together to keep doing this all together. So open your Bible to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. The reason I want you to do this assignment right now is because we're going to actually look at this verse on this coming Sunday. So it's going to be the very end of the passage that we're going to look at is going to be 2 Corinthians chapter 6, just the first two verses, but it gave us, I think it gives us a great little homework opportunity here. Okay, I want you to read verse 2, okay? Read, so somebody in your group read 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Take this moment to pause the video and be a part of the homework. The message will resume shortly. Okay, so you've all read it. Good job. That was not the hard parts. Okay, that was the easy part. I want you to notice a few things. We've been talking about inspiration, right? I want you to notice. I want you to tell me in, I'm going to give you just a second to think about it. I want you to tell me, who does Paul say wrote those words? Look at, you got to look at the text again and figure out who does, do it together, do it as a group. Okay, I gave you time. So who does Paul say wrote those words? God, right? Or he, but it's a, it's a capital, right? So can we agree? Do you guys all see that? Look at, um, for God says at, ju at just the right time, I heard, let me go to the New King James. It's the one you guys are, uh, oh, it's way, it's, uh, let me make sure, yeah. It might say, for he says, but notice it's a capital. Remember what I told you how to do that. If it's capitalized, it's going to be speaking about God. If it's the word Lord, all capitals, what's the word for that in, in the Hebrew? Yahweh, that's right. It's the word for God. Jehovah or Yahweh. Okay, so who does Paul say, once again, just to make sure we know this, who does Paul say wrote those words or said those words? God. Who actually wrote those words? Okay, I, ha I heard two answers. I heard Paul and I heard Isaiah. Now I want you to do, I'm going to pause and I'm not going to answer that one right now. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. This is a quote, right? It's a quote, right? For God says, and then he quotes that. I want you to find where that quote is from. And then once you do it as a group, I want you to, if somebody figures it out, I want you to tell the whole group how you figured that out. And if you're doing it this home, just at home, just talk to yourself. Tell yourself, hey, David did that. He said, soul, why are you cast down? <laughs> it's okay to talk to yourself. Okay, all right, enough. Where is this a quote from? 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2 is a quote from? Isaiah 49, 8. I want to hear from different groups how did you discover that? Wait, wait, hold on, right here. Hyperlink. Love it. Who else? Over here, anybody? How did you guys find that? It's written in the verse. How many of you have it in your Bible? It's written in there. It actually tells you. There's a little thing. Okay, this is, I, I've wanted to point this out because it's so important, you guys. If you, if you don't have, I want to encourage you to get this, a study Bible, okay? Not all Bibles are exactly the same. Some Bibles that are called study Bibles, they have a little bit of notes at the bottom. And those notes can be extremely helpful. They give you the ability to really become your own scholar without having to do all the work that they did to get there. It's not cheating when it's in the Bible. Somebody did the work and the goal is the information, not the results. Friends, study Bibles. Learn how, if you don't have one, buy one. And learn to use it. If you are using a Bible online, quite often at the bottom of it, you know, as you scroll down, there will be hyperlinks with that information. Use those things. When you see in a study Bible a little footnote or in an online version and a hyperlink, 
Look at it. Check it. Because I want you to notice something. Three people are inspired by God in the exact same words. Three different people. Okay? Number one. For who said, who wrote this? God. It says God, right? Paul says it was God, but who actually wrote it down? Isaiah. There it is. It's human and it is divine. But guess what? When God breathed through into Paul to write that down again, guess who else was inspired to write it? Paul. God, Isaiah, Paul. You see how that worked? God inspired it all. Isaiah was inspired by God. And then Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit to quote from Isaiah, became inspired by God. You see how powerful that stuff is? Kind of crazy. I want to do another one with you. You guys did good. You're, you're, by the way, like I said, I wanted you to cheat by looking at the little notes. It's not cheating. Use them. Use them, use them, use them. They are of great help to you. By the way, and we'll look at it on Sunday, it's interesting that Paul would quote from Isaiah 49.8. If you go back and read the context of Isaiah 49, it'll blow your mind. That's your homework, by the way. I used to always give homework in Hungarian. It's called Hazi Feladat. There won't be a test, but I'd always tell them, this is your Hazi Feladat. This is your homework for the week. So this is your homework for the week. Go back and look at the context of Isaiah 49 in, the, in light of 2 Corinthians 6 and tell me if it's not a beautiful, powerful, cool thing. Okay, let me give you one more assignment and then we'll do a couple questions if there are any. Uh, if you have your questions, now's the time. Send them in, por favor. Okay. Turn to Matthew chapter 1. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 1. And we're going to do the exact same assignment that we've done. You're going to do in two of these. And I want you to read verse 23 together. And then I want you to tell me, as a group, you figure it out, where is that? Is, is, is this the first time it is spoken or is it spoken at, at any other time in the Bible? So you're looking for, is it, is it mentioned in the Old Testament? Okay. So read, read together Matthew 1, 23, and then you're going to tell me the Old Testament equivalent. Ready, set, go. Take this moment to pause the video and be a part of the homework. The message will resume shortly. Okay, how did everybody do? Did you figure it out? Did you find it? Okay, Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Uh, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. By the way, the reason I had you do this is because the word Emmanuel is not a Greek word. It's a Hebrew word. So that is a clue. So where is it in the Old Testament? Isaiah 7.14, exactly. And so in Isaiah 7.14, God says the same words again. So, again, I want you to see the threefold the three groups of people, the three people that, in, that were inspired to write these words. Who are the three? Who's the first one? It's always going to be God. Easy, easy question always. When I, okay, it's always God. And then who's the second? Isaiah. And who's the third? Matthew. So God inspired Matthew to look back at an Old Testament writing and pull this in. And to say, guess what? What Isaiah wrote about? This is Jesus. It's powerful. It's some of the most powerful. And I mean, God inspired Isaiah to say it hundreds of years beforehand. And we're getting into the issue of prophecy. And that'll be one of our conversations is prophecy. But we're not there tonight. But also it was quoted by Matthew. So God inspired this. Isaiah was inspired to write it, and Matthew was inspired to write it. I want to do one more. Matthew chapter 27. I'm keeping it all in the same books just to keep it easier. Matthew 27, verse 35. By the way, your other homework could be this. Read Isaiah 7. It'll blow your mind that God would speak that prophecy about Jesus in Isaiah 7. It just 
it's mind-boggling. Read it for yourself. Matthew 27, verse 35. Read it together and then find it in the Old Testament. Take this moment to pause the video and be a part of the homework. The message will resume shortly. Let's bring it back in here. Matthew 27. They divided my garments among them and my clothing. For my clothing, they cast lots. Where is that in the Old Testament? Psalm 22, 18. That's correct. Again, three different people. God, the psalmist, and Matthew. Now, not every New Testament sentence has an Old Testament equivalent. It doesn't work like that. Not every New Testament sentence has an Old Testament equivalent, but many do. And especially when it is as clear as it is in the ones that we use. Now, sometimes there may not be, how did you guys find, I want to hear from this back section over here. How did you find, did you guys find Psalm 22? Did you guys discover it as Psalm 22? Yes? How did you find it? Okay, so you in your references, it was in there. Perfect. Sometimes you won't find it in there. But yet it'll be like, wait, that's a quote. I'm pretty sure that's a quote. Or I'm pretty sure I heard that. I want to encourage you on something. You might read something and go, wait, I think I've read that before in the Bible. Whether you do that in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, I want to encourage you something. Look for it. See if you can find Guys, if you can't find it, if you can't find it as a reference, you can't find a hyperlink, can I really encourage you to do something? Google it. I'm not kidding. Just be, is that, take the verse and put the verse right into Google, the search. Yeah, whatever search you like to do. I'm just using Google. Put it in there and see if it comes up anywhere else. And then you read that and you go, wow, what I'm reading in the Old Testament, I mean, when you read Psalm 22 and you connect this to Matthew 27, It's powerful. Your entire time of reading the Old Testament will come alive like never before. Give yourself the, and I believe that once you've read through the whole Bible, you've got the greatest computer the world has ever seen and cannot create quite yet. It's called your brain. It's amazing. And it never works when you want it to. But God knows how to make your brain work. And that's why I believe, I believe what Jesus said is very literal when he said, don't worry about what you will say. I will give you the words. And I really believe that you don't have to like, oh, I I haven't memorized the whole Bible. Well, you know what? You kind of have. If you will read through the whole Bible, did you know that God could bring any bit of it back to you when you need it? Isn't that powerful? And you say, well, couldn't God just do that anyways? Again, it goes back to the first thing we said. God gave us his word. Why would you ask God to do something that when you're not willing to just read what he's given? Don't, don't ask God to go in a different direction than he's already given to all of us for all of time. Read all of the Bible, and then one day you're going to be reading a psalm, and you're going to go like, wait, hold on a second. I think I've read something like that before. And then you look it up. And then you read a little bit from that and you go, wow, this like blows my mind and it gives me so much more context and it brings so much more beauty to the idea. It's a powerful thing to do. If you're wondering what any good teacher does when they're teaching the Bible, this is what they do. I'm constantly looking for Old Testament pictures that tell the same story that I just read in a New Testament context. That's what we're looking for. So we want to learn how to use your study Bible. Use the online hyperlinks. Use the internet. Everybody complains about the internet. Make it your, like, control it. Use it for great things. I I love the, the tools that are available to you and me. Use it. Okay, does that make sense? So, good. Inspiration. The two areas, the two elements, and then we'll do a couple questions. The two elements of inspiration are, it is a what book? It's a human book. And then secondly, it is a divine book. Don't mix those two. It's not one or the other. It's got to be both. It has to be. Even when God gave Moses the law that he wrote with his own hand, he wrote in a language Moses understood. It's always been given into human context. It's a divine book 
given to human beings, okay? Let me, uh, let me just pray for us, and then if there's any questions, we'll do it, and then we'll be, we'll be done for the night, okay? Father, thank you so much that we get to, we have a, this book from you, God, that is uniquely inspired, and because it is inspired uniquely, it has authority, Father, my prayer for each one of us is not that we would acknowledge that the Bible is inspired, but that we would surrender ourselves to your authorities, the authority that you have over our lives. Lord, I pray, and I've just really been thinking a lot about this for all of our lives, that you would forgive us, Lord, where we are not surrendered. Help us to surrender afresh to you, God. That your word would have authority and freedom in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Any questions, any questions at all on this or any of the subjects or topics? Any questions at all? Yes, sir. What's the purpose of the reference? It's, it's to make it, you, do you guys remember, um, what were those things, uh, what were those notes we used to have, those little yellow books? Cliff notes. It's cliff notes. And uh, what I mean by that is like, the, like brilliant, godly, intelligent human beings over the centuries have been examining the Bible and cross-noting it, we call it, referencing it, like, oh wow, this is spoken in here. Why should we all have to do that over and over and over? It's like, it's like reinventing the wheel. There's no reason for that. And so they give us these references to help us to grow in our own faith. Um, but remember, the references are not biblical. What I mean is like when your Bible says 2 Corinthians, when it says chapter 6, the little 6 there is not from God. Human beings put that in there. Those references, they're, and they're very clear about telling us when it's reference and when it's not. But references are there to help you and I be able to grow by crossing the Bible. You ever do those tests where it's like, here's the questions and the answers are on the other side and you got to cross the lines? That's what a reference is. I'm connecting the dots between this New Testament verse and this Old Testament verse. And then I'm learning and rediscovering it in all new ways. So it's a really important thing to do, okay? Yes. What is the importance of Mary and the saints when Jesus said he is the only way? Good question, Lionel. Um, I was just repeating it for our online people here. Um, the answer is qu quite simple. Uh, Mary is blessed and the saints are amazing and they're in heaven with Jesus. He is the only way. So they had a role, but they are not messiahs. Follow-up question. Well, you're getting into, it's a different, there's, the Catholic Church has different views about about saints, and they have different views about Mary than we believe the Bible tells us. Protestants, we tend to be like really down on Mary. We shouldn't be. Mary is like kind of insane and amazing and should be honored big time. And the saints should be honored and amazing. But the Bible uses the word saint to describe all people who put their faith in Jesus. There's a third one. Okay. It's not a question, but the answer is yes. Only bow to Jesus. Yeah, or worship Jesus, you know. Again, we say things that we have to be very careful of. There's a lot of cultures in the world where bowing is not worship. It's just respect. And then we translate it into our, like, Western culture, and we're like, oh my gosh, they're worshiping. It's like, no, 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 they're not. <laughs> it's called honor. We just do it different and not very well. So, uh, you just, yeah. Thanks, Lionel. Good questions. Roland. Help them to see that. Okay, good. So the question is, you know, in witnessing or in talking to somebody and they say, well, I don't believe that the Bible is inspired. And then we say, well, look at the Bible says it's inspired. And they say, I don't believe the Bible. And then we're back to the same dilemma, right? How do we, and that's what we talked about. There are ways where we can show people the Bible is the word of God or to prove that the Bible is without error. However, John 3, Jesus said, men love darkness rather than light. The reason that somebody will not come to faith is not because the, the Bible can't be proven. It's because they choose not to believe. So for me personally, and this is a good point, I tend to, and my, my, my actual like degree was in apologetics, so I love, but I don't like that. It's, telling somebody what is true doesn't make it 
is not a great door. I have to come in other ways. So I want to get to understand where they're coming from and just say like, okay, I understand that you don't believe the Bible. So let's put that aside, but let's just talk about what I believe about Jesus and how it's transformed my life. You don't have to believe the Bible, but how are you going to argue with what I believe God's done in me? Let me tell you my story. And that has a massive impact upon everybody that you talk. I promise you it'll change people. And so, you know, most people, it's called a smoke screen. I don't believe in God because I don't believe the Bible. It's like, no, that's not really your issue. Well, let's just put that aside then. Let me just tell you what God did in my life. I used to be like this and I used to be like this. And then I met Jesus and he's transformed my life. And I mean, how do you argue with it? You can't argue with somebody like that. Listen, use what people believe today for your advantage. We believe that everybody's subjective view is what's right for them, right? Well, amen to that. I believe that what God did in my life is what's right for me. And I can share that with somebody. This is what God's done. He's transformed me. He's changed me. And so you don't have to get into a, it's a tough thing to do once you get into an argument about how we prove the Bible. Because not even most Christians believe the Bible is the word of God. If we, if, you know, like I, I call us practical atheists at times. We love God on Sunday, but we forget about a lot during the week. You know, it's all of us. We have a human nature. We're still wrestling and growing and learning. So we have to also accept that there's a lot of people that won't believe the Bible. It's okay. Our goal isn't to make them believe the Bible, it's that they would know Jesus, and he supersedes the Bible itself. Good questions. Lord, thank you for our time together. Thank you for the night. Thank you that we get to look at how beautiful and powerful your word is, Lord. And we get to discover it and figure it out for ourselves as well, Lord. It's a beautiful thing, Lord. Bless. I'm praying for these that are here right now, Lord. Please bless them, God. As there's obviously a desire and an interest to, to know your word better. And I... Ultimately, God, it's not going to be because we're smarter, but Lord, we just trust you. We're going to trust you and we're going to believe in you to speak into our lives through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for joining us, whether online or in person. We pray that the ministry of Calvary San Diego is encouraging you in your faith. If you would like to follow along with what we are doing or hear more teachings, you can do so by downloading the Calvary SD mobile or TV app. Also, if you would like to partner with us and worship through giving, you can do so at calvarysd.com give. Thanks for tuning in.